It's the morning of January 27th, 2009, a Tuesday. I'm Michael Aaron, acting news director of NJN News. We're here at the Eagle Institute at Rutgers for the Rutgers program on the governor, the Thomas H. Kane archive. This morning we're going to be talking to Roger Bodman. Roger is one of the more prominent lobbyists in Trenton today, but many years ago he was a young Republican campaign operative who managed Tom Kane's first uh, successful gubernatorial campaign in 1981 went on to serve in the Kane cabinet, first as Commissioner of Labor, later as Commissioner of Transportation. Roger, how did you get involved in Republican politics? Well, I was always interested in politics. Uh, certainly when I was in college, I went to school at Ohio University, Michael, and uh, was involved out there. But when I graduated, which was in 1974, I came back to New Jersey to my hometown of Bernardsville. Uh, and uh, that was a year that a, a woman named Millicent Fenwick was running for the Congress. It was an open seat for Congress. Uh, Peter H. B. Freelingheisen was the incumbent who was retiring after 20 whatever years, and it was smack in the middle of the Watergate scandal also. Uh, and uh, my father, who was chairman of the planning board in Bernardsville for many years, uh, knew Millicent Fenwick, who was on the town council uh, back in the 50s and early 60s. Anyway, I had a relationship, and my dad was involved in a variety of civic uh, uh, opportunities and circumstances in, in, in Bernardsville. And anyway, long story short, uh, he introduced me to her. She had already won the primary uh, against uh, a gentleman named Thomas H. Kane, who, uh, who was that former speaker of the assembly and current, uh, I think at that time, minority leader, uh, for, for who also ran in the primary for that open seat. And I got, uh, I met with uh, Mrs. Fenwick in Somerville, New Jersey, who was hired as her driver uh, for that campaign. And that was my, uh, my, opening, my opening involvement in, in New Jersey Republican politics. What did your father do for a living? My dad was an engineer for AT&T uh, and uh, in the phone company for many years. Uh, uh, AT&T was kind enough to move their world headquarters from downtown New York out to Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, uh, you know, four or five miles away from where my father lived. He commuted, and out of, commuted in and out of the city for 20 plus years until they were nice enough to move their headquarters five miles away. And he, uh, he worked his whole, for his whole career at, 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 the, at the phone company. Where did you go to high school? Bernardsville High School, class of 1970. Brothers, sisters? I have, uh, I'm the youngest of four. I have uh, two older brothers and, and a sister, all of whom live out of state. What did you think of Millicent Fenwick when you were introduced to her? I thought she was a character, uh, but I was very impressed. I, she was, uh, she spent a good, her, here I was, a kid right out of college, as, as probably as naive as they came, uh, and she spent a good hour with me in, in her her campaign office, which was at 41 North Bridge Street in Somerville. I remember this for many years. The Republican headquarters was on, a, on the bottom part of that building, the first floor. And on the second floor, I spent, uh, I spent uh, you know, a good hour with her, speaking to her about a whole host of issues. I was just very impressed that she would take the time in the middle of a, uh, what was a, you know, a tight gubernatorial race to... Uh, you know, congressional race. Uh, excuse me, uh, a congressional race. I'm sorry to uh, you know to speak with with a young student or just previously you know, previously graduated student. So I was I was uh, impressed with her. What uh, what had she been doing that prepared her to make a run for Congress? Was she a, a local official? Was she? Well, she had been, in, as I said, she was on town councils. I think she was on the board of education in Bernardsville many years prior. But uh, more recently, she'd been in the state legislature. She was an assemblywoman and had been the, appointed by Governor Cahill as the director of consumer affairs. Now, this was right after Governor Byrne won elections uh, in 1973. This was 1974, as I mentioned, and so. She was uh, recently out of a job as consumer affairs director, but in those days, a consumer affairs job was uh, quite prominent, or she made it quite prominent. She, uh, she uh, had quite a bit of publicity surrounding her activities there. Was she eccentric? Uh, her, her reputation <coughs> many years later was as a... I mean, she was the subject we, of... Uh, 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 she was the model for Lacey Davenport in the... <laughs> what was it? In Doonesbury. Doonesbury cartoon. Well, she was colorful is the word we use, not eccentric, Michael. <laughs> and uh, she... Uh, but she's, you know, but she's also a very smart politician. Now, she, you know, she's a, a woman. Uh, in fact, here at Eagleton, uh, a year or two or maybe longer, uh, they had a symposium on her, or at least an evening with, with a, a, a woman that wrote a biography on her... Uh, uh, or the author's name is Amy Shapiro. It's a 
fascinating book about the history, very, almost a tragic life that she had. If you knew anything about Millicent's background, her, her mother died on the Lusitania in World War I, and uh, her father remarried, and, and it was sort of the evil stepmother, and Millicent did not get along with the stepmother and was somewhat disowned. She ended up marrying this fellow, Hugh, Hugh Fenwick, who was a divorcee, which was scandalous in those times, and had, you know, sort of a you know, an on and off, and never, never her personal, she, she basically gave up, I think it was fair to say, on a personal life in the late 40s, had money problems, and, and she wrote the Vogue book of etiquette in the late 40s. She worked, you know, she had to, she had to work even though she was, uh, uh, you know, from, from money. And because of the family relationship with her father and this uh, marriage that their father did not approve of, you know, she had issues. And uh, anyway, so long story short, uh, she dedicated herself to public service. You know, but she was a patrician. She was a character. She smoked that pipe when she wanted to. And Even back in '74, she oh was yeah. a pipe smoker. Oh yeah, always had it in her in in her pocket, and and would 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 say to reporters or, or news photographers at the time, or, or, or folks in your business, uh, you know, oh, don't take a picture of me with that pipe, except when she wanted it done, which was a key moment when she thought she'd get the most bang for the buck. She was a she was a politician. Had she been a Vogue <laughs> model in the '30s? Uh, I, she, she, she was a model. I don't know whether it was for Vogue or not, but I know she worked at the magazine. And that's where she wrote their book of etiquette in 1948, I believe it was. You say that you uh, were introduced to her after she had defeated Tom Kane in a primary. Very close primary. Very close primary. Had you met Kane prior to that? I had not. When did you first meet Kane? I met Kane during that campaign. Uh, you know, the, the district was then the fifth congressional district, and it ran to his, sort of the southern half of Morris County and ran down to essentially all of Somerset, and in, including the, the and then down into Mercer and the Princeton's, the Princeton Township, and Burn, I think West Windsor Township in Princeton. But it also included Livingston in Essex County, and that's where where Kane was from. So uh, I, I remember having met him during during that that. Uh, uh, that uh, general election uh, of, of that congressional race in 1974, and you know, Kane, as 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 he would later, was was very heavily involved in that in that congressional race. He did everything he could. He was never uh, the type of individual that that was a sore loser. He uh, he 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 did everything he could to help Nelson win that race, and it was later true of when Ray Bateman defeated him in the primary, and that's one of the things that impressed me with 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 Tom Kane when I first met him. Did you know of the Kane family? Heritage. I, I came to learn of it during that campaign, and was father and grandfather and so forth. So I you know, originally I did not know, but certainly uh, having you know, been as close as you know, there's nothing, no better job in a campaign, by the way, than be a driver because you're right next to the candidate and you're in the middle of every every decision, and you hear everything that's going on. So uh, I it was it was uh, one one enormous. Uh, <clears throat> quick study course in, in New Jersey politics and, and, and some of the individuals that hadn't been involved. So uh, I, I, became to, I came to learn of the Kane family heritage in, in that campaign. In point of fact, many uh, New Jersey political figures started as somebody's driver. Isn't that oh, yeah. There have been a number of articles about that. I think Jamie Foxx and uh, people, Peter Venero, who, who, who I actually hired when, when I was campaign manager for, for Governor Kane you know, in 1981. I hired him. Uh, I can tell you stories about him from even earlier. Uh, was a driver for a period of time. Uh, did you get to see Kane as a candidate at that point in time? No, I did not. I mean, again, I, I arrived in New Jersey in, uh, in early mid June of that year. The primary had just been held a week or two earlier. And by the time I, I ended up meeting uh, Mrs. Fenwick, I think it was mid July or thereabouts. But I did not, uh, I did not see Kane as a candidate. I saw him as a his, former candidate. What was his reputation at that point? Well, as, as, as just a class act, I, you know, the whole, the, uh, re recall that, that uh, it was the sort of infamous story how he became speaker uh, after only, he was elected in 1967. You know, I, I, of course, came to learn all this later, but he was elected in 1967. By 1971 or thereabouts, he was speaker, and that's a pretty rapid rise, uh, uh, you know, to... Uh, to, to get a top job in Trenton, as you well know, and so that and, and the manner in which he got there with Hudson oh, County story. votes it's and so famous, so forth. very it's one of the most famous stories in well, modern New Jersey political well, history. You may remember some of the details better than I, but the gist of it was was that that uh, in, in in the election in that election, I believe it was 1971, uh, which was the midterm election for Governor Cahill, who was a Republican elected in 1969. Uh, if I recall, uh, when the election was over in the assembly out of an 80-member body, I think it was 40 Democrats, 39 Republicans, and one Independent. And, and obviously that became, uh, you know, the, the issue of who becomes the speaker when you need 41 votes becomes, you know, a, a kind of a, a rather significant hill to climb, so to speak. And, and Kane managed to put together an, an oddball coalition which included uh, Hudson County Democrats, uh, 
in order to gain the number of votes, the appropriate number of votes to become speaker. And, and as, I, as I was not around in those days, but as, he understand, as I understand the story, he, uh, he gave certain committee chairmanships and so forth to, uh, to, uh, to some of the Democrats from Hudson. And, and one, one notorious uh, fellow there was a fellow named David Friedland, who, uh, who, who went on to become uh, a very infamous character in his own right. <coughs> So Cain made a deal with the devil is sort of how it boils down uh, historically. He, 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 you know, for a fellow that always sort of positioned himself above politics, uh, he was smack in the middle of it in that situation. What does that say about Cain? <laughs> it says that he's a very clever politician. And uh, believe me, I, I, I came to learn that uh, very well in 1981 when I managed his campaign where he, uh, you know, where he, 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 you know, was also a very good public servant, but he certainly understood, you know, that, that in order to, in order to, uh, to get there from time to time, you had to, had to do certain things as long as they were ethical and, and, and in his mind proper. He would, uh, you know, he, he did what he had to do, but he was a tremendous political strategist, absolutely tremendous. And still, ever, and still is, I might add. <coughs> had he ever employed that uh, on behalf of others? Uh, had he ever been somebody else's strategist? Not really. Maybe his son, <laughs> or tried to be in, in more recent years. But uh, as far as I know, he uh, he, and I'm sure he did it when he was in the assembly in terms of trying to keep his majority or uh, and so forth, and, and how to how to run the assembly staff and and subsequent campaigns. But and remember when he was in when he was speaker. I mean, his you know 1973 was a was a very tough year for uh, for uh, Republicans, obviously. You know, the, the incumbent governor was defeated, incumbent governor Bill Cahill was defeated in a primary by a, by a very conservative congressman, Charlie Sandman from Cape May, who went on to lose in a landslide to Brendan Byrne. And, and with that went, went the legislature, the, the Republican majorities that, that uh, were, in, were, you know, that, that were in office uh, during the Cahill administration were all gone by 1973. I think there was 14 or maybe 15 Republicans left in the assembly after the, this was smack in the middle of Watergate, so it was obviously a huge Republican scandal, but Cahill had some of his own scandal issues. So 1974, you're just out of college, you sign on as Millicent Fenwick's driver. What were your typical duties during that campaign? <laughs> Driving her, making sure she got, we didn't have GPSs in those days, Michael, you had maps and, and making sure she got to where she was going. And uh, I mean, she, uh, you know, from early in the morning, you know, the train, you know, train stations from six in the morning till, you know, in, in those days we still had some, some manufacturing plants in that area to plant gates to all kinds of events and parties. And, you know, I got to know uh, Somerset and Morris County pretty darn well. And uh, let me tell you, yeah, but uh, just uh, just getting her where she had to go. I work, and the campaign manager, by the way, was Jack Ewing. Assemblyman Jack Ewing was the campaign manager in that campaign. He was really my boss. He was the guy that hired me, technically. Um, <coughs> he always reminds me of that, by the way. You know, and, and they, they said later, well, you know, I must have done a good job as a driver because they made me DOT commissioner in a cane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> and that was only about ten years later. Right? It was, in fact, almost exactly ten years later. Uh, <laughs> Who were the other key Republicans of that time? Well, you know, I'm sure there were many outside the area that I knew, but, uh, you know, after that election, there was only three Republicans left in the, in the congressional delegation, one, one of whom was Matt Rinaldo, who just recently passed away, and, and the other was Ed Forsyth, who was a congressman uh, that in, in South Jersey in the Burlington County area. So I, out of, I believe the delegation was 16 at that time. We're now down from that. but. Uh, uh, it was, you know, the so-called Watergate babies uh, that were elected in 1974, one of whom was future Governor Jim Florio. <coughs> so Fenwick must have had an easy time in that district winning the general election. It wasn't easy by, by, by that by standard. Do you recall who the opponent The was? opponent was a fellow named Fred Bowen. He was a, a college professor at Princeton who would run two years prior against Frelinghuysen in 1972. Now, now, of course, that was Nixon's re-election year. This was prior to all the Watergate stuff breaking in a significant way. And, <coughs> and, 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 and Fred Bowen was somewhat of a sacrificial lamb, I'd call it, in that district against Frelinghuysen. It was a 20-year you know, incumbent, well, very popular. And, and, of course, Nixon won New Jersey substantially that year and so forth. By 1974, the political climate had changed substantially as a function of the Watergate scandals and obviously the interim election of Governor Byrne and uh, I think Fenwick, I don't recall specifically, but she only won that race by five or 6,000 votes in that district where you normally win it by 60,000 or more. <coughs> did you do work for her once she went to Congress? I did. I became her, her uh, district director running, uh, and, 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 and running her two district offices, one of which was in Somerville uh, and the other which is in Morristown. 
And uh, so I, I ran her district operation. She had three or four staff people in each of these offices and did a lot of casework and typical kind of congressional duties. But I represented her at, at events around the district when she couldn't be here. Of course, she was in Washington most of the time. And, and on week did the same thing. I was, her, I was still her driver in traveling aid, a little more responsibilities at this point. But I uh, <coughs> spent a lot of time with her. Uh, I got to know her quite well uh, and, and, and became very fond of her. I'll tell you a story later about the statue they have for her in my hometown of Bernardsville. Uh, I was uh, pleased to have been the, uh, the MC when it, was, uh, when it was dedicated so many years later. <coughs> tell us now. Well, this was in the mid-1990s, I want to say. I would say about there was a group of people that she was, you know, she was revered in, in Somerset County and, and particularly in Bernardsville. She was the, uh, there was two, there's two favorite daughters two favorite daughters from, from Bernersville, Millicent Fenwick and Meryl Streep. And, um, and uh, I just joked, I think, at the time, the only reason they asked me to be MC of this was because Meryl couldn't make it. But anyway, uh, they, they had a committee that was called the Millicent Fenwick Monument Committee, and they, they put together a life-size statue. You wouldn't ever, unless you really knew where it is, you really wouldn't see it. It's on the side of the little train station. Right across, if you know Bernersville, there's a restaurant called the Bernard's Inn, and right across the street there's a train station there. And there's, there's a statue, it's a life-size statue of her, it's just kind of a little garden around it and it's not, it's not you know, enormous or it's not on a big pedestal, or it's, it's just there. And, uh, but uh, uh, and, uh, when they dedicated it, uh, Governor Whitman was there and Congresswoman Rockama and a whole host of others that, that came to, her son Hugh Fenwick, by the way, was the mayor of the town at the time. And, uh, but I was honored to be asked to be the MC of that program because of my relationship. When did you next uh, interact with Tom King? Really, it was probably in 1977. I ran Mrs. I was Mrs. Fenwick's uh, campaign manager in 1976, which was a fairly easy campaign. Uh, Gerald Ford was up for election. Of course, he didn't win the presidency, but he did win New Jersey in 1976. Uh, uh, Fenwick had a fairly easy re-election run. Against uh, Fred Bowen again? Uh, no. The Bell Bowen... Uh, it was it was a it was a freeholder in 1973 Somerset County, which was Rock River Republican, elected a Democratic freeholder. His name was Frank Nero. He was from North Plainfield, and he was the congressional candidate in 1976. And uh, it was uh, again a sacrificial lamb situation. Fenwick by then was well well loved throughout that district and um, and won easily. So it was in early 1977. There was the local state senator there who I'd gotten to know as as because uh, as a uh, as, as the district uh, director for Fenwick, and his name is Ray Bateman. <clears throat> and I got to know uh, Senator Bateman very well and wanted to get involved in his campaign for governor. I was just, I wanted to be involved in the statewide, <coughs> excuse me, a statewide race, and, uh, and I got to know uh, Bateman very well. And to this day, I'm very close to Senator Bateman. He's a very dear friend. <laughs> so Bateman ran for governor in 77, and Kane against, ran against for Kane. governor. <laughs> was, there, was there a third candidate? <laughs> I don't, I don't believe so. I, there may well have been, but it may have been a minor candidate. Certainly, it was the two of them that were the, the key candidates, and uh, you know, it was very interesting dynamics. If you'd like to discuss that race a little bit, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. it, uh, Fen uh, Tom, as, as I just said, it ran against Fenwick in '74 for the Congress. This is now three years later, '77, and ran for governor. He was the chairman of the of the excuse me of the Gerald Ford campaign in 1976. Tom Kane was, and I know Bateman was annoyed about that because he felt that uh, you know that. that that an individual taking that position as chairman of the of the president's re-election campaign shouldn't use that as a jumping off point for a gubernatorial the next year. But anyway, that's <coughs> Bateman was was un unhappy about that situation. But the bottom line was that Bateman really was the organization candidate, and in 1977 uh, he had the lion's share of the county chairman's support, the organizational lines, and and uh, and, uh, and Kane was sort of the upstart uh, and. But, you know, ran a very effective campaign, but not effective enough to win, certainly. But it's really where I got to know Kane, uh, and, and really it was after. I was a field person during the primary in the in in general election. I was what they, what they now call the body man. I was the traveling aide for, for Ray Bateman. I literally lived with his family for s six months or whatever, and, you know, got to know the family very well. You know, some tragedies in his family. His oldest son died, Raymond, uh, some, some years later. Uh, Kippy, uh, now a state senator, of course, his, his, his son. But anyway, uh, I got to know the, the Bateman family very well. But the, almost the day after that primary in our headquarters, which was in East Brunswick, right down the road here, on, on Road 18, right down the road here from Eagleton, uh, uh, Tom Kane walked in the building probably within a week of that primary and said, what can I do to help? <coughs> And, uh, and was there frequently. This was not just perfunctory. This was very much like the 74 situation I described earlier with Fenwick. 
did everything he could possibly do to try to be helpful to that Bateman campaign. Of course, they end up losing to, to Brendan Byrne, but uh, but uh, Kane, and it, again, impressed me very much. So that's when I really got to know him. Was he bit. still an assemblyman? <coughs> he was an assemblyman, exactly right. And he did, did he have to give up his assembly he seat did. He was, in he order was, to run for governor? He did, and he was so he was in his final term as assembly, in his assemblyman. Was he still the leader? He was, I believe, he was a minority leader, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite sure he was, and he was he was the, uh, the you know they had. Picked up a couple more seats, I guess, in, in the. I don't recall specifically. I guess it was 73, 75. They picked up a couple of seats in 75 elections. So he had more. He had more than the 13 or 14 he had, you know, after the Baron landslide. But yes, he was the leader, and, but he was in his final term. He did have to give up his seat. Both, both Bateman and Kane both gave up their seats uh, to run for governor. Was he the same generation as Ray Bateman, or was he of a, a younger generation? <coughs> They're they're pretty close in age. They're probably seven or eight years apart. I think uh, Bateman just had a I think he's an 80th birthday, and, and I think Tom is what 74 or five in there somewhere. <coughs> uh, why did Bateman beat Kane? Organizational support. It was you know Bateman had, had run around you know had, you know he'd been Senate president. It was the first back in those days, as you know, they used to rotate leadership positions. The Senate presidency rotated year to year, not like we have now, where you have a, a like 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 uh, Senator Cody had been Senate president for years, or Don DeFrancesco was, and so forth. Back in those days, they literally rotated the Senate presidency every pres presidency, excuse me, every year. And uh, and Bateman was the first to serve, I think, two or maybe three years uh, consecutively. He was a uh, and you know interesting times. I can tell you tremendous stories about him. But the bottom line was is that uh, he 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 had all sorts of support around the state in the in the uh, in what I would call the Republican infrastructure, in particular the Republican county chairman and and the resulting organization lines, which as you know. Are very important. Who were the key Republican county chairman of that era? Oh boy, there was a fellow named Phil Matalucci who was the chairman of Cape May County. He was a real colorful character. He was a guy who used to go to Republican conventions, wear these huge hats with elephants and stuff all over him. He was a character. Uh, uh, Larry Pepper, who just recently uh, retired. Uh, uh, from Cumberland, Tony Statil. This was when Bergen County was heavy Republican, heavy Republican, and and and, and you know you didn't win, still don't win as a Republican in New Jersey, which is getting more and more difficult to do as we know. But you certainly didn't win without Bergen County, and Bergen County was uh, you know was pretty solid. There was there was a split in the county organization up there, and Tom had a part of it. But uh, uh, Tony Statil was was really a was really a kind of a, if there was a Republican boss, he was one of, one of them. And also in Somerset County, uh, an infamous gentleman named Luke Gray. Luke was a uh, was was an old time county boss. And and we, by the way, made a uh, in that primary. You know, we uh, of course Tom was from Essex County. Now Essex, of course, heavily Democrat, but a lot of Republicans there in a the primary, and it's obviously a much bigger county than Somerset. And uh, our goal was to match uh, offset Essex, uh, uh, Essex and Somerset counties, and we did. We we ran a. They called me the postmaster general during the prior during that primary because we had to hand address mail. I mean, you didn't have the labels and didn't have all the technology you had now. So I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers in an old uh, I think it was a bowling alley or something in in Manville, New Jersey, where we'd have hundreds of volunteers every night, and I was directing this thing and sacks of mail going out because you'd literally get voter lists from every county in the state and hand address and things. And, and then that night we had phone banks going until. You know the polls closed at eight o'clock, and you know three minutes of eight. You know we're still calling in a primary. People in Somerset to turn out. I mean so much so that we're annoying them to death. I mean you know we called me 16 times. Leave me alone. You know. But we, in fact, the, the Bateman can Bateman offset Essex County with Somerset in that primary. Do you recall who the Essex County chairman was? I do not. I do was not. it John Rayner? That was later. Late, I don't think John was there at the time. John was in the cabinet with me. He was uh, the community affairs director. He, 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 I, he, well, he may have been chairman. I, I frankly don't recall. I know he was. I, th I thought it was later, but he may have been chairman at the time. <clears throat> um, why did Bateman lose to Brendan Byrne? The income tax. Clearly, it was an infamous story. Uh, Bateman, uh, the, the income tax was the issue. Uh, the, the state Supreme Court shut down the schools in the summer. You know. Purposely, presumably, in the summer of 1976, I think it was, in order to, in order to get a stable funding source. The whole, whole, whole case, uh, the case regarding, uh, uh, regarding school funding, had been dealt with by the state supreme court, saying there was unequal funding for the schools, and we had to find a way to to make uh, make this, uh, you know, to solve this problem. Uh, and hence, uh, the income tax was voted in, uh, by, you know, and, and it was a very difficult, very difficult process, as you know, in the state legislature. It was really, you know, Governor Byrne worked very hard to get it done. He believed it was the right way to do it, uh, and in fact did. And uh, 
the bottom line was, was that, uh, and if I remember right, Cain voted for it at one point, but I don't recall. Maybe someone else will. Anyway, the bottom line was it, it was the issue of 1977. It was due to sunset. Typically in Trenton fashion, they didn't, they didn't install it permanently. They, uh, they put this, uh, they, they, they put it in the income tax, I guess it was in 75 or 76, I think it was, and, and it was due to expire at the end of 1977, so it was sunset provision. Hence, you know, the obvious question was, how are you going to run the state without the income tax? And, when, and Bateman came together with this, this cobble together plan, I'd call it, uh, which, uh, which, which, he put, which he conceived along with the uh, Treasury, former Treasury Secretary, a fellow named Bill Simon, who lived in Morris County in Harding Township in New Vernon. And Bill Simon was Nixon's Treasury Secretary. So this plan came to be known as the Bateman-Simon plan. And Brendan Byrne, in an infamous uh, press conference, stood up with his dry wit and said, this plan will soon be known by its initials. And, uh, <coughs> it was one of the more infamous campaign <laughs> stories I've ever heard. And, and it was delivered in typical Brendan Byrne fashion, as, as dryly as possible, with just a huge round of laughter from the resulting press corps. And it was a cobble together things that literally included offshore oil revenues and I, I think a penny increase in the sales tax, a variety of other things that was going to replace the revenue for, uh, for uh, uh, for, the, for the schools and, and, and thereby let the income tax lapse. Obviously that didn't happen. And, and by the way, the whole question of rebates was, was a key question. If Bateman were sitting here, he would tell you that he lost because of the rebates, that, that the rebates were rather blatant in those days. They came out a few days before the primary and the general, you know, with Governor Byrne's name blazoned all over the check. And, you know, and, and, and it, was, uh, it was the first time we had this property tax rebate program. And uh, it was very effectively done. Bateman did tell us for the Brendan Byrne archive mm -hmm. here at Rutgers that uh, he knew he had lost the election a few days before the election when he went home after a hard day of campaigning, mm -hmm. checked the mail and found his rebate <laughs> check in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm sure. I'm sure. <coughs> um, so what do you do after what, yeah, what did you? What was your role in? What was your role in the Bateman Bateman. campaign? Well, as I said, in a primary, I was really a field guy. An early part of the thing, organizing certain counties, uh, you know, getting, getting, uh, you know, going down, meeting with the county chairman, and, and, and organizing, you know, municipal leaders and so forth and so on. Later in the primary, I was, the, as I said, the postmaster general. You know, I was doing all that mail operation. And in, 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 the, in the general election, I was his traveling aide. I was the so-called body man. I, uh, I, I traveled with him everywhere. What did you do after he failed? Well, I was uh, unemployed for a while. This is when I started to learn that politics wasn't necessarily a stable uh, occupation. And uh, I, but I was there. I was hired by a, an upstart assistant county uh, uh, county uh, assistant county uh, prosecutor in Warren County named Jim Quarter. This was 1978. So an assistant Warren he was, County. He was an assistant Warren County prosecutor. His name was Jim Quarter from Hackettstown. And he uh, he wanted to run for Congress, and I, I, I actually got involved with him. There was a, a, a woman who was the county chairman of Morris at the time. Her name was Eileen McCoy, and I was friendly with Eileen from my days with Fenwick and, and later. And uh, she was enamored uh, with, with uh, Mr. Quarter. And uh, this was this was uh, the adjoining congressional district to the Fenwick district. This was the 13th congressional district, which ran at that time from essentially western Morris County. Uh, the Rockaway area and west up into Sussex, all of Sussex, all of Warren, all of Hunterdon, and a little piece of Mercer, in this case, I believe it was Ewing Township. So it was basically the whole west coast from, you know, along the Delaware River from Trenton to, uh, to, to High Point. Anyway, uh, and it was, it was uh, one of the so-called Watergate babies I discussed earlier with the, when, when, Congress, when Congress, then Congressman Florio was elected in 1974. One of the others elected that same year was uh, the wife of the former governor, Bob Miner. His name was Helen Miner. So she was, a, and she was elected in 74, was re-elected in 76, running, uh, running against a Republican state senator named Bill Schluter, who's a name you're probably familiar with and who's, who's, who's been around for a good number of years. Uh, Schluter uh, had, had uh, lost his Senate seat in, in the Watergate elections of, I guess it was 73. Uh, to Ann Martindale, in, in, who was an ambassador later, a Democrat who recently passed away, uh, and uh, and he was running for Congress in 1976 against uh, against Minor, in a race that uh, a lot of us, myself included, thought he should have won. 
He didn't. Uh, as I said, Jerry Ford won that year, won New Jersey by about 50,000 votes, won that district by a lot more than 50,000 votes, but, but was, he was unable to unseat uh, Mrs. Meyer. And he wanted to run again in 1978. And he also, the Congressional Republican National Committee in Washington, wanted him to run again under the theory that you know, he had name ID, he had, he had a pretty good run the previous time, he was the favorite, and so forth and so on. We didn't quite see it that way. And uh, I was hired by, uh, by quarter. And uh, and ran a very well, it was a very close primary about 150 votes he won by very close but quarter we ran a, a very I, I think it was uh, it's sort of uh, if you, if you know how Bill Baroni the state senator runs his campaigns now going door to door and 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 is uh, uh, very religious about it and very uh, does it in a very concentrated way well quarter did the same thing we ran a door to door campaign in that primary now mind you this is a sprawling congressional district I mean as I said it goes from Trenton to Sussex County and these houses aren't you know nice little you know alongside each other in a nice little development they're you know miles apart in certain cases. But you know, you know, you you knew, and at the time you had county records, uh, uh, voting records. You could tell who the what we'd call the four out of four voters, or the more de most dedicated primary voters, who the people that actually turned out. So we ran a very targeted door-to-door -door campaign, and this guy worked his tail off for months and months and months and knocked on doors. What does four out of four mean? It means that the people vote in the f last four elections. They vote in every primary election. So if you're going to vote when the assembly is the top of the ticket for the, in a primary, or if you're going to vote, you know, in in, in non-presidential year, a non-gubernatorial year, and so forth, uh, you know, you're a pretty dedicated voter, and therefore you don't waste your time with folks that go vote one out of four because the chances are they're not going to vote. And, and uh, this was again, this was the U.S. Senate race was up in New Jersey. Cliff Case was running for election. Fortunately, he was defeated in a primary that year, but. Uh, uh, you know, this was a race that would you would really have to look at a very dedicated primary voter, and that's what we focused on. So, Quarter beat Schluter in the primary, and then what happened in that general election? And we went on to uh, take on Helen Miner uh, in the general election, and uh, and did some of the same things. You know, same. Obviously, we broadened the uh, the strategy with regard to this door-to-door -door thing, because there was a lot more people in the general election to focus on than there was in the primary, obviously but did uh, a fair amount of the door-to-door -door campaigning as well and just uh, worked it very hard. Basically said she was out of step, nice lady, out of step with the district. She was, uh, you know, a, this was a very conservative Republican district. I mean, she, she, and she was a nice lady and she was out of step with the district. I mean, uh, the reality is she was... Was she a liberal uh, Democrat? Liberal, yeah, moderate to liberal, more liberal. And, and she actually was an interesting issue. She had met, one of the things, one of the curious issues, that she had met with Yasser Arafat at one point as a member of Congress uh, for whatever reason, I guess presumably she thought this was something worthwhile to do. And as a result, from a financial point of view, she was very much disliked by the Jewish community. Not the, just the Jewish community in New Jersey, the Jewish community nationally. And we would get checks from Miami, Florida, uh, unsolicited. I mean, and I'm not talking, you know, little checks. I'm talking $1,000, which is the maximum you could give. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars donated from around the country and you know that was really because of that that was uh, a, a considerable factor certainly from the point of view of financial support was <laughs> brendan burns record in the state an issue in that federal campaign in 78 yeah. uh not really he had just gotten reelected, and uh and, and fairly easily over Bateman. i don't recall the specific numbers but it was not a close race and 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 burn you know everyone called one term burn obviously it was two term burn and uh and so he really wasn't a record really we focused on miners uh, miners congressional record and and you know she pretty much towed the democratic line down in in, in washington and and you know, we had sufficient monies to to run a an effective campaign and uh, quarter ended up winning. I, I remember very well. We were in Hackettstown election night, and and there was one particular uh, Lopatcon Township, which is in down near Phillipsburg, New Jersey. It's one of the townships in southern Warren County. Now she uh, she her power base was from Phillipsburg. That's where her where her husband was from, where Governor Miner was from. He was a state senator for years prior, and this is back in the fifties and before. Anyway, uh, and and this is an adjoining town. And I looked. I remember. I remember to this day one one election district, Lopatcon District Three. Uh, it's a fairly rural area, but it was a Democratic area in the southern part of Warren County. And I, you know, we ended up winning that district. And I picked up the phone. I said, "Congratulations, Congressman." He says, "It was, you know, this was 8:32. I mean, we had no, no results." And he says, "You sure?" I said, "I'm absolutely sure." You know, and figuring if you could beat her in Lupatcong, you had to beat her district wide. You were going to win the Republican areas, of course. You know, <clears throat> did former Governor Minor campaign for his wife? Do you recall? I 
don't I don't recall specific. I think he did uh, from time to time, uh, but I, I don't specifically recall honestly. What was Tom Kane doing at this point in time? Tom Kane was a retired uh, assemblyman at this time, and uh, and and he was not involved in this particular campaign, uh, uh, to my memory, in this congressional race. And again, it was you know outside his base area. And I suspect he was contemplating his future, and uh, but 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 I came to know later he was clearly watching this race very carefully. Why? Well, because when he asked when he asked me to run his 1981 campaign, it was based upon my performance on that 1978 campaign. This was one of very few uh, races, Michael, if, if memory serves me, uh, that. Uh, that were Republican uh, defeated a Democrat in that election cycle. You know, I don't recall the statistics, but it was it was uh, a relative handful of races around the country where where an incumbent Democrat was defeated. This was one of them, and uh, so therefore it was somewhat notable. Uh, and and I got a, uh, you know, deservedly or not, a, a reputation of being one of the, you know, I was 25 years old. You know, one of these young smart political operative types uh, and uh, caught Tom Kane's eye. I, you know, we had known each other, you know, not well, because I was a relatively junior staffer on the, on the Bateman campaign, but we certainly knew each other from that. But now I, uh, I had a bit of a reputation. What did Kane do to retain his visibility while out of office? Not a lot, uh, you know, and, and uh, though he was very close to, believe it or not, and still is, to Governor Byrne. And, and Byrne appointed him to the Highway Authority, which I know to this day the Governor, Governor Kane very much appreciates, uh, and they were friends. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it's hard uh, to maintain your visibility, particularly when you're out of office, and, uh, and he was. So he, but I think he still, you know, went from time to time on the, uh, you know, the, the, the so-called rubber chicken circuit dinner thing, you know, and, and but. Uh, to my knowledge, he really wasn't. There was not. There was not an overt plan to say, "Gee, I'm going to run again four years from now." In fact, I would suggest he was. I don't want to use the word reluctant, but certainly not sure he was going to run for for governor another time. Recall that 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 he had already lost two primaries. He had lost a congressional race against Fenwick that we discussed. He lost the gubernatorial primary against Bateman that we discussed. And and this is you know sort of in this business three and you're out, you know. And I think Kane had if he wanted to run for statewide office again or any office again, he had to be very careful when how he chose when he chose to run, and and in what circumstance because he really couldn't afford another primary loss. I'm reminded that he also uh, appeared on television regularly. That's true. In 1980, and I appreciate your, in fact, on New Jersey with New Jersey Network, uh, and and he was an analyst for for, uh, for 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 NJN for a good number of years. I don't know who the Democrat was. That Dick Leon. Dick Leon. Okay. Two very smart very guys. Very smart guys. I remember him going. In, in fact, as we were preparing for the uh, for the. Uh, uh, campaign in 1981, and a key actor in this, by the way, was was uh, former Republican chairman, former congressman, former assemblyman Bob Franks. He was a key actor in helping Tom decide to run for governor in 1981. I can get to that in a minute. But when, as we were preparing for this, and, and as I had signed on to run the camp, it was really you know we we're in the early part of 1980. I was in Washington as chief of staff to Quarter, running his congressional offices down there at the time, and. Uh, and, but I had agreed, uh, really, with Bob Franks as the intermediary, as a dear friend of mine, as you probably know, uh, to, to sign on to this to this gubernatorial campaign once once uh, once Kane decided he was going to do it, and uh, and uh, I want to say it was in the spring or summer of 1980. Uh, now this was right in the middle of the, of the presidential race of so Ronald Reagan versus Jimmy Carter. And, and the Republican convention that year was held in Detroit. I was there with Quarter. Again, I was at the time his Quarter's chief of staff, so it was in the summer of 1980. Kane, you know, and, and there was a, a character that came on the political scene named Bo Sullivan. And Bo was a, a businessman from Totowa and, and a gregarious Irishman and wanted to run for governor and, and uh, threw this big lavish party out at the convention in Detroit that year. And Kane showed up as an analyst for NJN and uh, got a lot more publicity, <laughs> more, more out of it, we think, as, as the NJN analyst than, than Bo did, spending hundreds of whatever, certainly thousands of dollars on his lavish party. Um, so tell us the story of how the Kane campaign incubated. Well, and I say this with all due respect to uh, some others I'm sure you'll interview at some point. I mean, they, as I just mentioned, they, they, you know, they had lost two primaries, and they had good people. Tony Ciccatello was one of them, was his campaign manager, at least in one, if not both, I don't recall, in his, of his earlier primaries. But I think they realized that, that you know, one more primary loss, and that would be it for, for you know, it would be tough for him to resurrect himself, whether, whether a congressional opportunity presented itself or, or another run for governor or whatever. 
So they were, I think Cain was rightfully uh, concerned about, about, you know, picking the moment, so to speak. Uh, and I think they saw us, you know, when I say us, I mean, it was, uh, you know, Bobby Franks and, and myself and others that were really, you know, I've met Bob on Bateman's campaign, by the way. He had just graduated from law school at, at, uh, down at SMU, and, and uh, we met each other on that campaign. We were, and we were like, we became very close friends then, and we were, you know, kind of in the primary doing field work together and whatever. You know, I think Kane got to know us and said, you know, these guys, uh, you know, at least they won primaries, <laughs> you know, <laughs> bring them on. And I think that's essentially what happened. So in what year did that happen? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think. When do you think it all started coming together? It started together? to gel, I want to say, in, in early 1980. Early Bob 1980. was elected in 1979. He, it was a, an open seat for the, for the legislature, and he was a very young assemblyman. He was 20, 26, or 27 years old. He was the youngest assemblyman at the time, was elected for in, in a county convention situation for an open seat. But he got, he, he, he was enamored with, with Tom Kane, just, just thought the world of this man. And so he would go up and see him, go to his house, you know. Talk to him all the time and convince him, and, and ultimately I think played a significant role. I'm sure there were others, but in convincing Kane that this was the right year for him, he should do it, you know, and uh, and he'd help put the team together. And and uh, I was one of the team. I mean, again, who else was on the team? Well, there was a character named Alpha Sola, who was a uh, who was a friend of uh, a friend of uh, Bob's from from college that he went to undergrad at DePaul in Indiana, and uh, and Fasola came on board and and. I mean, there was a, uh, it, once once the once the the Kane chose to to run and he started to put together. Uh, he had a lot of, of course, his, his his many supporters from before. I'm talking about some of the Bateman types he brought over. I call the Bateman types me, myself, and Fasola and and, and and Bobby Franks. But he had many many people. You know, Jane Burgio, a whole host of Phil Coltenbacher, a whole host of folks that were were, and a whole host of others that were friends and and former assembly people and associates of his. Carrie Edwards and others, but the, uh, the I'm talking about the you know the, the full-time campaign types, and and in, uh, he uh, once he decided to run again in the early part of 1980s, this whole thing started to gel. Uh, you know, he also had an infamous uh, Republican consultant. His name was Roger Stone, and Roger Stone has a has a, a curious reputation out there as being sort of the dirty trickster from the uh, from the Nixon years. Sort of an odd. Character, in my opinion, to uh, to be affiliated with a fellow like like Kane, who had this sort of squeaky clean, you know, above it all, you know, non-political type approach to uh, politics, uh, and 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 Kane and, and Stone was viewed as a, just a hardball, you know, political, you know, actor. Uh, but you know, as I like to joke now, we had to sort of make Kane a temporary conservative, and that was to win a primary, you know, and he knew it. Uh, and I knew it, and, and that's why he wanted Stone. Our, our, our media consultants was a firm at the time called Bailey and Deerdorf. John Deerdorf was a, uh, in those days, was I think he had done, was involved in the President uh, Ford's re-election. Uh, anyway, so. Did you work with Roger Stone, or did he oh, yeah. a separate operation? Oh, no, no, I worked very much with Roger Stone. What uh, was he like? Uh, Stone, Stone is, uh, uh, I guess his, he was a little, little uh, more mellow, perhaps, in those days than he is now, or at least by reputation. I actually, I actually got along with him well. I mean, you know, there was the typical role: you have your consultant, and you have your day-to-day -day campaign manager. And 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 you know, in that role, sometimes that can be a tough relationship. Sometimes the media, you know, the the, the outside consultant is trying to go around here, or in some way causing problems, or there's not a, a warm relationship or a work a good working relationship. In this case, there was. And Stone, you know, I, I, uh, he had some good ideas, and he had, more importantly, he had good contacts at the national level. Now, mind you, this is by the time we're into this primary, it was the spring of 81. This was when Reagan was just inaugurated. And, uh, <clears throat> and so... Had Stone worked on Reagan's campaign? I don't believe so. He may have had, I, I, his, his, his partner, Charlie Black, certainly did, you know, and, uh, and he may have said some role, but uh, I'm not sure he had a direct role. Uh, but in this particular instance, he was, uh, he was our, our, uh, uh, our, our general consultant. And amongst other uh, interesting things he did was we had to discuss, you know, we, I, guess I, I joke about it, but I'm really not joking that much. We did have to make Cain a temporary conservative. I mean, uh, we were running in a Republican primary. And it was also the first primary that was publicly financed. It was different from 1977. So, and there was numerous candidates. I think there were eight. 
I can, I'm sure I can remember all of them. I mean, it was as I, our primary, the key opponent was not Bo Sullivan, the fellow I mentioned with the lavish party earlier. Our key opponent was a fellow named Pat Kramer. And Kramer was the, uh, was the, had been the mayor of Patterson, it was a, non, a bipartisan, nonpartisan May election. But he also, he was a cabinet officer in the Cahill administration. I think he was Commissioner of Community Affairs. But he was the organization choice. He was the Ray Bateman of 1981. At most of the county chairman, McCain still, McCain was always viewed as somewhat of a maverick. He was a John McCain-esque type of guy, you know, and and was not necessarily favored by the county organizations. He had bucked the county organization in Essex when he first got elected to the assembly. He was run as a reform ticket, so he was always viewed as a, you know, as a longtime member of the NAACP. I mean, he was, you know, the very attributes that I think helped him as a general election candidate did not help him as a primary candidate. Um, certainly amongst the many of the organization types. Anyway. So, and there was a variety of others that ran for ran for uh, for governor that year. Jim Walwork, a former senator from Essex, uh, a conservative. Uh, Barry Parker ran. The mayor Jack Rafferty, Tony Imperiali, the infamous character from Newark. And there were, I, I may be forgetting some, but there was, anyway, there was eight. I think there was seven on the Democrat side. So I think there was 15 candidates in that election. And in my opinion, the primary reason there was 15 candidates. A lot of them were this sort of upper out attitude. At the time, there was a relatively small threshold you had to raise in terms of get this two-to-one matching program under the state's gubernatorial uh, public financing law. And uh, so some of these folks said, eh, I'm, I'm giving up my seat in the legislature. Hey, let's run for governor. You know, why not? I was the editor of New Jersey Monthly Magazine at the time. Right. And I recall that there were 21 candidates for governor may because well be right. we put them all on the cover of a magazine. The governor was that big? Uh, like, like, like Look Magazine? Was well, we made, <laughs> we made each of them a sardine in a can of sardines. And I think there were 21 sardines You in may a well can. be right, but anyway, it was lots. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the, uh, in that particular, one of the dynamics of that campaign was, as I just mentioned, was that uh, Kane was, was not or was not loved by the county organizations. Well, l l let me go back to Stone for a minute. Again, we, we, you know, one of the benefits of having Roger Stone, we had, uh, there was a, a congressman from upstate New York, Buffalo, New York, who was uh, a darling of the conservatives. You know, remember his name? Jack, Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp was a darling of the conservatives, right? Well, he was a very close relationship with, uh, with Stone. And Stone got him to come in and endorse Kane in the primary. And now, it's unusual for a sitting congressman or anyone to endorse Kane. Now, Kane, and nor, nor <laughs> it was more unusual to have a darling of the conservative boards endorse Kane. Again, there were some others that, that could really lay out, you know, credentials that are much more conservative by far than Tom Kane's. You know, Jim Walwark, for one. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that was, became very helpful, again, it has to do with this so-called temporary conservative situation. So... But uh, did, did Kemp do that simply as a favor to Roger Stone, or did he know Kane? He really didn't know Kane. They had met each other, I think, briefly. They had some minimal relationship, I think, from the Ford campaign. But remember, I think Kemp was a big Reagan guy when Reagan ran against Ford in the primary in '76. So it really was, in my opinion, you know, if memory serves me, more 90 percent uh, Stone and. Uh, that brought that brought that in, and uh, if I remember, I think Gerald Ford also endorsed him in that primary. If I recall, it may have been the general election. I, I don't remember, but uh, either way, why would Ford do that? Because he was his campaign manager in 1976. I mentioned earlier, and uh, his New and Jersey uh, campaign exactly, chairman. Exactly, but really worked it. I mean, you know, Kane you know, was very heavily involved in '76, and uh, I think that was the the circumstance. There was a very close relation. And remember, Ford won New Jersey in '76. I mean, he won, lost the presidency, but he won New Jersey statewide by 50,000 votes. A relatively close election. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't win the presidency, but he did. He did carry New Jersey, and therefore Kane had a had a pretty good reputation with Gerald Ford. What else? Did you do to try to uh, push back against Pat Kramer's organizational well, let me tell you about the, well, in those days there was, as there is still is, there's a series of county conventions, and uh, three of them come to mind here. You know, it, Kramer was the organization candidate, as I mentioned. He was the Ray Bateman of 1981. He had the, the lion's share of county chairmen supporting him and so forth, and he was clearly the front runner, no doubt, And in January and February of 1981. So we did two things. One was, was make a, a good stand in these, in, these early con, in the early conventions. The first one was in Middlesex County. 
And as you know, this is where the county Republican organization types, the county committee people go to these conventions. There's certain, each, each convention had a different set of rules, but by and large, they, 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 it's the county committee types go and they, uh, they have a, on a Saturday, on a given Saturday, and they make an endorsement. And that, that's how they award their line. Each county does it differently, but in, they're in these, those, these, those counties that hold these types of conventions, it's just generally speaking how it's done. First one was in Middlesex County, and we won. That was great, okay? So the organization guy, Pat Kramer, who had all of this organization support, loses the first convention. The second one was a week or two later in Union County. Now, you know, Kane could lay some claim to Union County. You know, that's where Kane University is, and, and his Elizabeth, and, uh, and, and Elizabethtown Gas, uh, for the family business for many years and so forth. Uh, Bo Sullivan made a, you know, made a real effort in, in, in Union County in this convention. When the first ballot was over, uh, no one had enough votes to win. So it came time for the second ballot. The Kramer's campaign manager uh, came to me and said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll tell you what, you throw your votes to us in the second ballot to defeat Sullivan, who really, had, I think, in, if, uh, had come in second in the first ballot, but not enough. You need 50 percent or whatever to win. Uh, you can throw your votes to us, so we win, and then in Ocean County, which will fall, we'll throw our votes to you. I'm like, yeah, I was born at night, but not last night, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no. I said, let Sullivan win, you know, and, and in fact, that's exactly what happened, and Sullivan won on the second ballot. The reason we did that, Michael, was that we weren't worried about Sullivan. We were about Kramer, because Kramer had the organization support that I mentioned earlier in a whole bunch of other counties. I wanted to knock him off in all these early counties. So even if we didn't win, he was no longer, you know, we, you know, we, we, we ran in 77. We had name ID. You know, if we could, if we could, sh if we could stop the, or at least slow down, you know, the, 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 the Kramer machine by defeating him in, in these early uh, organization tests, we thought that was the right thing to do. And sure enough, a week or two later in Ocean County, well, we, we didn't have the sufficient votes to win on the first ballot. We, we threw our votes to none other than Barry Parker. And Barry Parker, who had represented portions of his, his Senate district, was in Ocean County at that time. So he was a, sort of a quasi-favorite son. So Barry ends up winning Ocean County. Now, you know, again, uh, the theory was that we, uh, you know, we wanted to knock off Kramer. So of the first three significant organizational tests that year, Kramer won none of them, and it, it, it did a pretty good job to derail his campaign. Uh, the story gets better, however, because it falls in the, in the, this falls in the classic case of you don't like the rules, change them. Uh, I mentioned the relationship that Kane had with Governor Byrne. And Governor Byrne was now in the latter part of his second term, couldn't run again. And, and as you mentioned, there was numerous Democrats uh, uh, attempting to succeed uh, Governor Byrne, one of whom was John Degnan, who was his attorney general. And John Degan was then a young guy and, 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 and had the governor's support. He was very much in the same boat that Kane was. He was not the favorite of the Democratic county organizations, as Brendan Byrne was not the favorite of the Democratic county organizations. So doing what two politicians do best, remember Kane was the, uh, was the assembly leader for many years and still had many, many friends in the assembly. They passed a piece of legislation that prohibited county organization endorsements or awarding of the organization line in gubernatorial primaries only. By the way, blatantly unconstitutional, as it 15 years later, in fact, was declared unconstitutional. Well, well what about was the it time? Open primary? Uh, yeah, it was an open primary law, but it didn't deny them in, 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 in Senate primaries or anything, just, just gubernatorial. And it took effect that year. So effectively, it wiped out all the organization lines in, 19, in, in that primary of 1981 and did all the way up, I think, by the time the, the lawsuits caught up with the law, it was, it was Whitman's second term. Anyway, so, you know, uh, that was, and it was done as a function of, of of the relationship that Kane and Byrne had, because they both had a common interest, you know, in 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 doing away with with that particular organization law. So the large field worked to Kane's advantage, would you say? Oh yeah, no doubt about. It. By then, but once you once you knocked you eliminated the organization line situation, and I said in the early part before we this law was passed, that law was passed. I want to say in March or or even late April, I forget, in that time frame. But these conventions were earlier, and our goal was to knock off Kramer on those, and we did, in those three county conventions, one of which we won, but we made sure he didn't win the other two either. And there may have been other ones, uh, but those three were the well, ones that come to mind. But after that, uh, you know, it, it, once the law was passed and just eliminated, it just took the wind out of Kramer's sails. He, you know, he did end up coming in second, but the, uh, but, but 30 or 40,000 votes behind Kane. Did any of the uh, 
usual Republican litmus test issues play into this primary abortion, gun control, death penalty, do you recall? Some. Death penalty did. I think Kane endorsed it, though very reluctantly. He signed it when he was governor. Never was, as you know, was never never implemented in any way. And most recently, were, you know, was, was they, they, uh, they eliminated. Uh, the others, uh, Kane was pro-choice, but I don't remember the issue being significant. It was, it was there certainly, and and it was it was out there. But again, this is where the where the where the, the massive field helped us. Uh, Kane won with I think about 30 percent of the vote. I mean, of course, there's no runoffs here, uh, but you know, 30 percent of the vote was enough, and uh, in an in ever whatever eight or eight way field, whatever it was. So. Uh, but he did have his so-called tax plan. That's one of the, I forgot to mention that, one of the reasons Kemp came in here. I mean, he sort of coined this interestingly. He sort of endorsed Kane's plan, but not Kane. I mean, I guess it was sort of this, <laughs> and, and, you know, this was, this was a plan to reduce the income tax and the sales tax, both of which Kane reversed exactly 100% when he got to be governor. But we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so Kane ran in the primary promising that he would reduce the income tax, not eliminate, just reduce, reduce. the income and the sales tax. Yes, sir. And it mailed. I remember, I remember sitting in Walter Kavanaugh's bedroom in Somerset County when we were getting the mail ready and going all going. What was Walter at that time? Walter was an assemblyman at the time. You know, the late Walter Kavanaugh was was a supporter and a, and a and a wonderful man. Anyway, we were for whatever reason we were in Somerville and we were in his house and we're literally sitting in his bedroom, Kane and I, going over this piece of mail we're about to mail, which detailed this tax plan. And believe me, Kane was like fretting. Uh, he did not. I know in his heart of hearts he did not want to do this or say this. So it was probably one of the more difficult moments for him, I would suspect. And, and he said, okay, fine. I said, because I need him to sign off on, on agree. This, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about it, you know, and conceptually it's another thing to put a couple of million pieces of mail out there with this thing detailed for the world to see and you guys to criticize and somebody to tear it apart and whatever. And uh, he was reluctant, but ultimately did it. <clears throat> Because? Because he knew that he knew the fiscal problems of the state. I mean, he had been the speaker. He understood the whole issue of, 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 of what this would mean and, and budget cuts. And as, as, as his governorship later proved, uh, he wasn't afraid to spend a taxpayer's dollar. But you, <coughs> but you put it out anyway because? Because we had to make him a temporary conservative in the primary, Michael. I mean, remember, he was, you know, and, and, and he, you know, I think he really did believe. I, this, remember, this was in the era of, of, of Reagan just gotten elected, supply side economics. You know, Reaganomics, uh, those were the code words of the day, right? You know, uh, supply side being, you know, the Laffer curve, all this kind of stuff. That was, and, and I think there was, uh, I think Kane was, I to be fair about it, probably, you know, betwixt and between, let me put it that way. He probably, I'm not sure he was bought into the whole supply side thing totally, but I think he did realize, or did believe that if he could cut taxes to a degree, that, that it would help spur the economy. Now, when he became governor, in the early 1980s, you know, it was a very difficult time. We were in a recessionary period. I can discuss that. I was labor commissioner by then, and I could tell you well what the unemployment was and so forth. But, uh, so, uh, How did you get your message out in those days in a primary? All we mail? Had, mostly, but we had some television. We could afford some television. Again, uh, it was publicly financed. And let me talk about the financial side of this for a minute. One of the reasons the Jim Quarter uh, situation became very. Jim, Jim became his 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 uh, statewide uh, honorary chair, uh, and and when Kane ran for governor in 1977, he did not have a broad-based fundraising operation. He had, you know, he was a well-to-do fellow, and he had some good friends. But you know, there was no limits. I don't believe in the campaign back then, unless you took uh, public financing only. It was effective, excuse me, in the general election not the primary, in 77 I'm talking. And, and therefore he had a, a relatively small group of wealthier people that wrote large, you know, relatively large checks for, to support his candidacy. He did not have a strong, a strong or wide fundraising base. Uh, by 1981, the rules, as I just said, had changed. The primaries were now publicly financed and you had to, I forget what the limit was, $800 I think it was that you could, that you could raise, but you had to raise a whole bunch of $800 checks from a very broad base in order to get the matching funds, a two-to-one formula that still exists in, a, in, in today's law. And obviously the numbers are a lot higher, but anyway, and, and it was very helpful to have Jim Quarter's uh, financial list. In other words, when he had run for Congress in 78 now and re-election in 1980 now, 
uh, I had run his re-election, it was kind of perfunctory re-election, but ran his re-election in 80, you know, he had a broad-based fundraising list, and I was not reluctant to tap into that list and use Quarter as, as our primary fundraiser for Cain in a primary, because obviously we're very happy to have, you know, the the wealthy individuals that Cain had as his previous supporters, but they were a limit to 800 bucks, you know, and you need a whole bunch of $800 checks in order to get that matching formula. Obviously, in the general election, it was the same. So, uh, Quarter was very helpful in that regard, just having the apparatus of his uh, congressional uh, fundraising, you know, was very helpful. What was Cain like as a retail campaigner back then? If I could get him out of the house, it was fine. You know, he, you know, I mean, going up to his house, you know, he was, God love him. I mean, uh, he's, you know, we used to call, he was, he was two hours late to everything in his life. I and mean, we used to call it Eastern Cain time, which was about two hours behind the rest of the world. Uh, and this, this, by the way, continued throughout his eight years as governor and probably to today. He's, uh, he, he uh, and is one of the, one of the things I believe ultimately why he was elected. It's very much was a personality driven contest, I believe. But the bottom line was, is that he, you know, I mean, I'd go up to his house and he'd be looking around for his socks and his shoes and his, you know, this and that. And, you know, <laughs> governor, you know, we didn't call him governor in those days, but, you know, ever, by the way, ever since he was elected governor, I've never referred to him by, to, to his face by his first name. I've always called him governor since, 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 since the election night of 1981. Anyway, but then I called him Tom, you know, uh, or assemblyman when I was mad at him and said, you know, let's go. But getting him out of the house. But he was, he was, a, he was a great re re campaigner. He loved to campaign. You know, almost too much. Uh, you know, he'd complain about his schedule typically. You know, I don't want to get up at six in the morning, and go to the train station, this kind of stuff. But you know, by and large, he was very good. But you know, he would talk to if anyone who wanted to talk to him, he'd spend a time of twenty minute conversation with anybody. You know, and that's why he was two hours late to everything. So I mean, that was a plus and it was a minus. I mean, everybody he was he was affable, he was friendly, he uh, people enjoyed him uh, talking to him, and he enjoyed talking to them. Uh, but from a campaign manager, when you have a real, you know, you got. 24 hours in a day, or 12 or 14 or 15 that are hours that you need to have him hit you know, six or eight events. Yeah, keeping him on schedule was a chore. You mm -hmm. say that Pat Kramer was your principal rival going into the primary. What kind of retail campaigner was he? I think he was good. I mean, I, uh, to this day, I saw Pat at the Republican convention this year. He's, 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 he's a wonderful man. He's a nice guy, but I just think he, you know, he, he banked too much on the, uh, you know, on the organization support, and when that went away, uh, it really, it really sunk his campaign. And the fact that that Kane had won, had run two or four years prior, he had some. There was sort of an. Imp there were some folks out there within the organizations and elsewhere that, that felt it was Kane's turn. You know, he had, you know, he had run in '77 in a primary. He lost. I mean, he, he there was some residual name ID certainly in the Republican um, amongst the pub Republican primary voting electorate. And uh, so, but but I think Kramer was a well, he was a good campaigner. I mean, he was an affable guy. Again, he was a mayor of, of Patterson, a very affable kind of fellow. But uh, Kane, I think, was better. <laughs> Uh, you alluded to the fact that you had some money for television. Do you recall how much TV you used? In not, the much, uh, not much. Not uh, much. We did have some, and, and I'd have to. I, I was I was telling uh, Don Linky here that I would try to uh, come up with some of the primary television spots. I think I may have some of them sitting in the attic someplace if I can find a dusty old box and bring them down here. I'll do so. But I don't recall the amount. I don't even recall the amount. The limits. There was severe limits, as you know, as you know, accepting public financing. Uh, you know, was, uh, the good the good part was the state the taxpayers were kind enough to match your donations on a two to one basis. The bad part was, was they cap you at a certain amount, and it's a relatively low amount. So uh, even in those days. Uh, so, but we did have some TV, but I don't recall the budget. Do you recall if there were debates in that primary? Oh yeah, there were. I, I, I don't. I don't remember any notable moments from them, but uh, they were clearly there. And uh, you know, you had this small army of people sitting up there, so you know, everybody got to say 14 words, and that was it. How did Cain so, do? Cain did fine. You know, again, he, you know, Cain is he of all of those individuals. I mean, his experience in the legislature. I know others were legislators. I said Barry Parker and. Wall work and so forth, but Kane was, you know, he had he had been uh, he had been a candidate a statewide well, a statewide candidate once in the Bateman primary, and he had been a been a congressional candidate in the Fenwick primary. So I mean, he and his you know his father had been a congressman and so forth. He's he's good in that form, you know, and and he knows the issues. Of course, he was the speaker, you know. Kane speaks like a patrician. <laughs> um, we've all gotten used to it, mm -hmm. but I would imagine that the New Jersey electorate first time it encountered Cain might have a hard time uh, embracing a man who spoke like that. Was there any uh, thought given or effort made to change him and change the way he spoke? 
Not really. I mean, you know, he, he had speech impediment as a child, and I think, I believe it was a stutter circumstance of some form or another. So he, uh, we did try to get him to enunciate his words, and then if, you, some of the, if I can find some of these spots, some of them you can see they were almost trying too hard, so to speak. You could just see the movements of his mouth where he was trying to enunciate his words, uh, and it was more based upon upon that, that, that earlier speech issue than it was upon, you know, this Bostonian or New England accent that he seemed to have. And God knows where he picked that up. I mean, I know he was up at, in New England as, a, as a, you know, for many years, but, uh, and, uh, but uh, you know, it is what it was. There also there was the infamous gap in his teeth, as you may remember. He had to, you know, and people, oh, we'd go take him to a dentist and get, get those. No, I mean, he had, you know, Tom Kane, you could never do that stuff with Kane. Kane, Kane was and is what he is. I mean, and uh, he, I can tell you stories about his clothing, which would... Uh, Tell me one. Yeah, well, when he ran in a primary, I mean, he, 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 he was not the most debonair character you've ever met. And, and he had a sport jacket, not unlike this, with these leather patches on the, on the thing, which had holes in them, literally. And I swear, he, I said that was the Hamilton F. Kane Memorial sport coat. I'm sure it was. You know, I was his grandfather, the senator. Anyway, uh, and taking, so I, I asked Chicatello, Tony Chicatello, at one point to... Uh, and to take him to a, to a clothing store and get some new suits because his suits were just awful. You know, just old and just ill-fitting and so forth. So on. <laughs> anyway, long and short of it was is that he, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I made Tom, Tom break out his American Express card. I think it was the first time it was out of his wallet. And, uh, and sent Chicatello said, go get him some decent clothes. Get him a couple of suits. So, you know, bought him a couple of very nice suits, you know, pinstripe, dark gray, whatever, charcoal, you know, nice suit. I also told him, by the way, that you know he used to wear this belt, this belt that he made when he was a camp counselor up in New England. This belt was like one of these beaded kind of belts that had his initials in the back, and it was like you know a camp counselor type thing some kid made or he made, I don't know. And it was, and, and half the beads were falling out of it, a little ratty looking thing. I said, get a nice black leather belt to go with his new suits. It would look very nice. So you really redressed this man? Oh, absolutely. Well, trust me, he needed to be redressed. You know, if you saw some of the clothes he had, it was just awful. We so we got him a couple of decent suits, but, but he wouldn't. Here's the story about the belt. He, he would come into his office, and I can't do it when I stand up with this thing, but he would literally pull his arms back like this and, and stand in my office at the, at the campaign headquarters and, you know, just pull his jacket back and just saunter around the room and while he's talking to me, and he would do it specifically because he's wearing that darn belt, and he would do it just to annoy me. And, and you know, just that was his way. I'm, you know, you can do so much with me. That was his message. You can do so much. You can push me so far on this stuff. But some things I'm just not going to give up, and he wouldn't give up that darn belt. I st he still wears the darn thing. I've seen it. Uh, he still has it, and he still wears it. The ironic thing, and this is this is the hilarious part, when in his first year as governor, he was named one of the ten best dressed men in America. His 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 uh, camp, uh, his, his press secretary, uh, Carl Golden, called. I was at the Labor Department at the time. Called me. and said, "You're not going to believe this." You know? <laughs> and and he said, he, he, "They thought it was a joke. Literally, they called me. They thought it was a bogus organization. Somebody making a joke." Absolutely, they named one of the ten best dressed men in America. It was hilarious. You say you got <laughs> Kane to op open his wallet and get, <laughs> pull out his American Express card. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the and the moss flew out. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah well, some <laughs> people think that wallet was held together by rubber bands. Uh, clearly, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, uh, one story I had with him is when we took him to, uh, in the primary, I think this was maybe the general, the, the candidate can put in X number, I think it was $25,000, that the candidate can give to, uh, under the public financing rules to their own campaign. That was the max. He says to me, I don't have $25,000. I said, what do you mean you don't have $25,000? I mean, you know, I, everyone thought Kane was this well-to-do fellow. He lived in the mansion. Well, well, he lived alongside the mansion, really. You know, was, his house was on the, on the parents' property, on the, you know, as the mansion was around the corner. But anyway, it was a beautiful house on the, you know. He certainly, by all appearances, would be able to have $25,000. So I took him to the bank, which by, was one of the banks that the family had started, Livingston Nash or whatever it was. And I drove into the, I drove into the bank and drove, said, this man wants to borrow $25,000. He's like, okay. <laughs> he did. I said, Governor, not then, Tom. I said, if you expect other people to donate these monies to your campaign, you can put in his 25. I think he just, I, he may have gotten, we may have repaid him. I don't remember, but, you know, it may have just been a loan. But regardless, uh, I drove to the bank, literally. He's notoriously, uh, I Frugal? Say, Cheap. Frugal, yes. Cheap. Let's call it what it is. <laughs> you know, the joke used to be when he and Kaltenbacher was his assembly running mate, used to go to drive through the Parkway tolls and he'd pretend he was sleeping. <laughs> 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 the court market put the 35 cents into the bucket. In those <laughs> days, know. it was probably only a quarter. Well, it probably was a quarter in those days, whatever, yeah, right. You know, anyway. 
that was that's that that's our governor. God love him. <laughs> Who were the key money people? Uh, John, John Hansen was probably the primary money guy. Who uh, was John Hansen? John Hansen is a, a real estate developer in Bergen County, and a, and a good friend. Uh, Colton Bacher was also. Colton Bacher uh, was, as I said, it was an assembly running mate. But it was it was the president or chairman of a. Of a Major company in Newark at the time called Seaton Leather. I don't know if they're there any longer, but Phil's long retired. But John, John is still around, and uh, they were really the two of the key, key finance guys uh, during during that campaign, and uh, and they were very helpful, very helpful, as I said. So going into primary night, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was Nick Brady also involved? Nick was uh, was somewhat involved. Uh, Nick was actually very close to Bateman in the Bateman primary. I knew uh, I knew Nick very well. He was you know later Treasury Secretary under both Reagan and Bush, the father, Bush number forty one, uh, and he was involved to a degree, but not not as much as these other two. I mean, Kane named him a temporary senator. He did, in fact, in nineteen in in, in early nineteen eighty two when when Harrison Williams. Uh, had to resign under the Abscam scandal. Going mm -hmm. into the primary night, mm -hmm. do you recall whether you knew it was in the bag or? We felt pretty good about it. You know, we had both of our campaign headquarters or that parties, if you will, that evening or at, the, at a Holiday Inn. It used to be on Route 10 in Livingston, a traffic circle there. And uh, we felt pretty good about it. And uh, What do you mean both of your parties? Well, the general election also. Oh. Okay. You know, uh, and uh, so the uh, so the uh, in the primary uh, he uh, we 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 went into thing feeling pretty good. In fact, it was I you know I, there was not a lot of primary polling that I remember. Uh, I'm not sure we even had internal polls. I don't think we wanted to spend the money on them at the time, candidly. But uh, we had you know we 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 went in there with a pretty good feeling. In fact, did you issue polling in those days? We did an early benchmark, yeah, an early benchmark poll, uh, probably in, I don't remember, I may have it if I can find it, I will, uh, probably in, uh, you know, early, early part of 81, I would say, uh, you know, February or there, March or thereabouts. And, you know, but the ballot test polls were, your, our tracking poll was well outside our budget in those days, you know. But anyway, so uh, I, I remember that primary night very well, and, and again, one of, you know, who shows up, uh, gregarious Bo Sullivan, you know, comes running into the room, you know, well, I think. Tom was out making his victory speech, and there's Bo come bounding in, and, and un, sort of unlimited energy that he had. Did Bo get anything out of that? Uh, did Bo get appointed to something? Yeah, Bo was chairman of the Turnpike Authority later, after Kane was elected, and and was one of the chairmen, I think, of our of our inaugural. Was he uh, one of the other finance guys? By the way, was Fletch Kramer, senior. Uh, Fletch Kramer was a con contractor, uh, and and Larry Bathgate. I I was uh, Bathgate was. Uh, uh, a big supporter of George H. W. Bush, Bush 41, when he was vice president, and when he was running for president in 19 uh, in 1980 against Reagan. As it, of course, he became the vice presidential nominee at the Detroit convention I discussed earlier. Anyway, uh, I went to see. I had known Larry by reputation, uh, but I'd never met him. Uh, and during that primary, I went down to see him because I knew he was a and I was a young attorney at the time in his late 30s, early 40s, and and was a prolific fundraiser and had been very heavily involved in that Bush campaign, as was Nick Brady, I might add, they were close. Anyway, long and short of it was is that uh, he had already signed up for Bo Sullivan. And uh, so I said, okay, fine, uh, I'll, come, uh, I'll come see you uh, after the primary. We're going to win and I'll come see you after the primary. And I sure, absolutely I did. I went down to, he lives in Bayhead, uh, I went down to Bayhead after the primary. Went and had dinner. He took me to dinner at the Bayhead Yacht Club, and uh, I said, "You're on our team now, sir." He said, "Absolutely," and he really was helpful. Because I think the three chairmen of the uh, of the inaugural, if I recall, we had tri chairman. I'm jumping ahead here, but was 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 uh, Fletch Kramer, was Larry, and was Bo Sullivan. <coughs> Do you recall who the key issues people were around? Ken? Yeah, Gary Stein was really primary. One of the primary. Uh, Ken Marin was on our staff. Who later was insurance commissioner in the administration. Uh, I'm sure there were others. I don't know. Dane Bergio was involved in that to a degree. He was later Secretary of State. Uh, but uh, Gary uh, probably was sort of cheap amongst them. Uh, and he, of course, later was a Supreme Court Justice. You say you remember primary night well. What do you remember? I remember Bo Sullivan bounding into that room, and I remember winning uh, with 30. One percent of the vote by about thirty thousand. I remember the general election much better because it was somewhat infamous. But uh, uh, yeah, that was a. I remember Bo, uh, who was who was just a character. You had to love this guy, rest his soul. <coughs> yeah.
Um, Seven minutes left, Michael. Okay. Confident going, f f uh, confident of winning. Was Kane confident of winning the general election? The primary. I think he was. I, you know, I, I don't know, frankly. I mean, I think he was sort of fatalistic about it, uh, Tom. I think he had, you know, he, I, I, I believe that he thought we did everything we had to do, you know, the, particularly the fact that it was an open primary. There were no organization lines. I think he had a significant number of, we had a significant number of endorsements around the state amongst us. So we really held our own in, in the endorsement game. You know, the, the, uh, as I said, the uh, organization lines having been taken away was vitally important to him. So, you know, we did everything we could reasonably do to, uh, you know, to, to, to the tax plan that we talked about, the, the, uh, the Kemp endorsement. I mean, we, we really had some, you know, we had some wind in our sails going into that primary, no doubt. Do you recall how he uh, responded that night to victory? How he reacted? Uh, he, you know, he, he was... Uh, Obviously, he was thrilled, and I, but he was, uh, you know, we, we tried to set the tone for the general election, you know, and uh, he, he... What, what uh, kind of tone did you try to set for the general election? Uh, inclusion, which was, became the hallmark of his, uh, of his uh, governorship, as you know. I talked about education. He talked about, you know, much broader realm of issues uh, than, than sort of just tax policy and sort of, uh, you know, things that you would really address in a primary. This uh, was his first primary win after two defeats, was he uh, ebullient? Was he elated? He was elated. And I remember talking to him while he was at his home still in, in, in Livingston. It was just up the road from where this, this Holiday Inn was, I mentioned, in Route 10 there. And he was, he was thrilled. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, but we also knew the realities. I mean, we were real underdogs going into the general election. Uh, Why? Uh, well, Florio won the Democratic primary. He was a popular congressman from South Jersey. Uh, and, uh, you know, the early polling, including Eagleton polls here, showed that, that we were substantial under I don't remember the exact number. Kane says it was 30 points. I don't think it was quite 30, but it was 20-something. You know, and we knew that we had a, a, a strong hill to climb. Uh, how quickly did the temporary conservative move Go away? to the middle? Yes. Well, we, uh, you know, the whole issue, I mean, you know, the issue of the, of the uh, tax plan, you know, followed him around, certainly. It wasn't, you know, uh, people in your profession and others were certainly going to uh, not let him get away from it. And, you know, but it wasn't necessarily a, a negative. And, and it was, again, this was, remember the, the climate we're in. This was Ronald Reagan, okay, Reagan's first term, Reagan's first year. You know, they had the assassination attempt on Reagan, which was in March or thereabouts of 1981. Now we're, you know, fast forward to June or July, the summer of 81. His tax cuts were, were were very much uh, going through, and and so, you know, it was not. Uh, but but what he so he didn't run away from the tax plan by any means. What he did do, however, was just broaden the scope of issues. As I said, education, inclusion, and, and things that he also you know environment. He sponsored the bill that created the Department of Environmental Protection, and you know, uh, and and we started uh, in the summer of 1981. We 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 uh, we created what we called the city tour. And what that was, was, uh, you know, it's the dead time in the summer, okay, you're now sitting in the doldrums of July and August and whatever, and we, uh, we uh, created, a, uh, created a tour for him and, 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 and sent him to every major urban center in New Jersey. We called up the Democratic mayor and said, the Republican nominee for governor, Tom Kane, wants to come see him. What are they going to say? No, I'm not going to visit with this guy. You know, some of them I'm sure didn't want to, but, you know, and of course we had, you know, whatever press we could have tagging along. And, 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 and the point of this was to, to, to create, I mean, this, this, here's a man that's going to walk, I mean, again, he's a card-carrying member of the NAACP, did, always did very well in Newark, had, had relationships in, in what I would call non-traditional, you know, Republican-type constituents, African-American groups, other minority groups, arts groups, of course. And, and he would, we, we, we sent him on this tour, and he'd go around to each of the, whether it's New Brunswick and Camden and Patterson and Newark and, you know, you name it, Asbury Park, whatever, Atlantic City, and we'd meet with the mayors and we'd always get a little bit of press, some, some sometimes a little more than a little bit, and, and it, cre it started to create the image, the legitimate image, that this man was not your average, you know, he was certainly not a right-wing Republican, he was very much a moderate, and he very much cared about these, and he could talk, gave him the, the opportunity to talk about some of his own experiences in terms of when he represented portions of the city of Newark while he was in the assembly and so forth. So, How did Republicans react to this non-traditional uh, method of courting the public? I think they were fine with it. I, you know, I mean, the only general election or immediate, excuse me, general election problem I had was with, with then Assemblyman Bill Gormley, 
who, as you know, is, 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 is not a sedate individual, to put it kindly. And Assemblyman Gormley at the time was our sole supporter in Atlanta County, and he won almost unilaterally due to his own, I think he went and dragged every individual personally out of Atlanta County to vote for Tom Kane, and we ended up winning, uh, even though the, the, the county chairman there was a fellow named Fritz Hahnemann, who was one, one of Gormley's mortal enemies. Gormley had many, as you know. And, and long story short, uh, uh, I had to send, I felt it was appropriate to send Kane to an organizational breakfast in Atlanta County, again, trying to put everything back together, you know, peace, unity, that kind of stuff. Gormley went absolutely nuts. I mean nuts, and only the way he can. You know, it was one of the, I've, I had, I can, I can, you know, gauge my relationship with Bill Gormley over 20 years like a curve like this. He either hates you or he loves you, and he hates you or he loves you for whatever the issue was. And that time, he, boy, did he hate me. I mean, and, and let it be known to me and, and a lot of others <laughs> in a certain language. Um, we're going to take a break okay. and we'll get into the 81 general election campaign when we resume. Very good. Tom Kane on a sort of city tour in the summer of 2000, of 1981. Right. Um, you were taking the campaign to Jim Florio's turf. Is that essentially what you were doing? Well, to his turf, to Democratic turf, to, to areas that Republicans had at least historically conceded. We weren't about to concede the urban centers of New Jersey, Michael. We thought that our candidate, Tom Kane, given his, his uh, district, uh, his legislative district, included portions, many urban areas, portions of Irvington and portions of Newark, I mean, he, uh, and, he, and, he, and he did well in some of those areas. So we were not going to concede the, uh, the urban centers to the Democratic Party, in this case, the nominee, Jim Florio. How formidable was Florio as an opponent? Very formidable. I mean, he, he had a tremendous record in, in the Congress. He was, uh, uh, he was the father of the Superfund uh, law, uh, so to speak, and, and had, you know, had really had very strong environmental credentials. And, and, and you know, came from, from, from Camden County, which was a notorious, uh, you know, somewhat, some might say infamous, uh, you know, Democratic stronghold. I mean, and, and had a, in other words, he had a huge base. You know, and he was uh, he was still a sitting congressman. Uh, you know, our friend uh, Tom Kane, as we've mentioned, was a former assemblyman, having having left office uh, four years prior. So he was very considerable, uh, you know, and formidable, I should say. And he and he also uh, you know had a significant lead in the polls in in, those, in the early polls. Uh, Eagleton was the was the place to go, so to speak, in terms of, of New Jersey polling in those days. And and. Uh, and so we were, we, we were clearly the underdogs. Did Florio have any obvious weakness that could be exploited? Well, you know, he, it, it, I believe at the beginning of the campaign, it was hard for us to determine a weakness. You know, in, in any election like that, you're always looking for some hook. There was not major issues driving New Jersey. There was not huge budget deficits. The income tax issue we talked about during the bateman uh, Byrne race of 77 had been resolved. and. You know, the people seem to have accepted it by then. There was not any burning issues. The economy, at least in 1981, was still in pretty good shape. You know, the, the Reagan presidency was in its infancy. Uh, you know, supply side economics, as we mentioned, was sort of the, you know, and Reaganomics was the kind of code word of the day. Uh, so these were the, these were, this was the atmosphere in which we were, this campaign was being conducted. And, uh, and, and Reagan, of course, uh, you know, from, from Reagan's point of view, this was one of the first tests of his presidency, both in New Jersey and Virginia. And I can tell you some interesting stories about that when he came in to campaign for Tom and when he, uh, when he, when he did a TV spot for us. When did he, when did he come into Tampa campaign? In October, I want to say. Or September, I don't remember. I can, I can, but it was in in the, in the early fall, uh, and he did a, a a TV spot. Now, this is a story. I remember flying down. He he he. The president had a stop in Philadelphia for some luncheon or some speech he had to make, and we met him. I flew down in a helicopter with with Tom Kane, and we were in a hangar in the Philadelphia airport, uh, and they had set up this temporary little television studio with the blue curtains hanging around and so forth. And and they uh, and we did the TV we did a t did a TV spot and they, and, and they taped it in that in that airplane hangar. The president was 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 in this thing, and you know those those things have to be you know coming from television you know very well 29.3 sec whatever it was the exact thing that you had to have this done. 
Reagan rattles off saying, I'm not in the business of telling people how to vote. I remember the lines, you know, except, you know, but in this case, I really like this man, Tom Kane. You know, he goes into this thing, 29.2 seconds, right on the money, okay? So, except at the time, an airplane took off in the background, you know, run, you know so, so, so you had this background noise, so they had to do it a second time. Two takes, 29.2 seconds, this time no airplane in the background, and it was perfect. I mean, it was just classic Reagan. And uh, then he came up and they went to uh, Morristown. They landed, uh, they landed uh, in Morristown Airport and went to, the, I think it was uh, one of the hotels up over 10 in, in, in Whippany or in, Par in Parsippany, that area. Did you know. um, they debate uh, Kane and Florio? They must have oh, debated. Sure. Oh, sure. Under the, under, the, under the public financing law, there's a requirement for a certain number of debates. I forget, two or three. And they had them, and uh, and and I, I think uh, I think we're pleased with uh, with with uh, Tom's performance. Uh, one I remember very specific. It was in South Jersey. I forget where it was. It was in the, in the suburbs of Camden County somewhere, or maybe Gloucester County, and uh, obviously Florio's home area. And so I remember I remember going down with with with, with Tom, and you know we had tried to prepare him. So but anyway, there was some. Road that was being rebuilt or reconstructed, I forget the name of it, but it had a kind of a curious name, and Kane made a mistake. He tried to pronounce this name and fumbled it. And of course, Florio jumped on him, well, it's pronounced as such and such, uh, you know, assemblyman, you know, uh, and got a, it was a clearly favorable audience. Uh, but you asked the question, was there a weakness there? You know, what, what, in my opinion, came out of that campaign was the weakness that Florio ultimately had was his own personality. And what I mean by that, he was a very driven, kind of steely, almost hard person, you know, very punctual, very much on time. As we talked about Kane, I joked about the Eastern Kane time earlier. Uh, and, and, and my observation of his campaign was that this was, you know, Mr. Discipline. I mean, he was, uh, he, there was never a second to spare. He wouldn't speak to anybody. He'd boop in, boop out, you know, uh, on to the next stop. Uh, and, and, and the print media in New Jersey was very important in those days, much more so than now, uh, in my opinion. And, and if you saw the adjectives that your colleagues of that era utilized to describe Kane, they, they would talk about affable, nice, friendly, those kinds of kinds of adjectives to describe him. And and Florio was driven and, and hard. In fact, one of the one of Florio T V spots was I remember to this day. Uh, and if, if Governor uh, I'm sure you'll interview Governor Kane for this his interview or for this process hopefully he he will well remember this. Uh, Florio ran a TV spot, and, and, and it was supposedly of his mother. There was a woman sitting in the background, like making spaghetti or making dinner in the back of this, and he was, make, and he was complaining about Reagan budget cuts, and, and basically the gist of the commercial was that, you know, Tom Kane is Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan is a hard-nosed you know, guy that's going hurt, to hurt people, you know. And, uh, but it was done in black and white. The TVs, for whatever reason, I don't understand why. You know why they didn't use color, and 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 and, and he didn't. And he, and he references his mother, uh, presumably an actor or actress, I should say. I don't know if it was his real mother, but never said hello, mom, or you know, kissed mom, or thanks for dinner, mom. It was just like you know, all right, where's my dinner, you know? And and it just drove home, I believe, the image that was already starting to form. Now this is, this is you know, the stuff that, that's very hard to quantify in any campaign. I can't say, no one can, for certain, that this was a factor. I believe it was a factor. And I've read those, you know, those, those pieces, you know, you know, the bio-type puff pieces that are inevitably done in any campaign, and, and, uh, but even in other pieces uh, that were done, uh, it, just, it just seemed to me that an image was created of, of Cain and as uh, history will show, by a very slim margin, enough people voted for him over the other guy. But uh, the polls continued to narrow throughout the fall of, of, two, of 1981. Was that the strategy to uh, to sh uh, showcase a contrast in personality? No, it wasn't. It was it was more default than it was uh, by design, frankly. What was you the know, design? The desi we were trying to, you know, that's the problem with that campaign. We were looking for a hook. That's the exact words we used. What's the hook in this election? What's going to get in, in, in what, uh, what otherwise was a sort of nondescript political environment? What are we, what's going to, you know, what do they, what do they care about? Because they seem to be reasonably happy. I'm talking about the voters here, the electorate. They, you know, and there wasn't, uh, wasn't any driv, dri, you know, driving issues of the day, or at least that. So one of which we, we went after was the, was the code word f change. 
and, and with all due respect to Governor Byrne, the Democrats had run uh, New Jersey for the previous eight years. And, uh, and, and so we, we focused on that, on the word change, as much as, as, we, as we could. And, 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 and Governor Kane did very well, then candidate Kane did very well in, in amongst the uh, newspaper editorials. He was supported by many, if not most. Uh, I don't recall the specifics of all, but I know he was endorsed, uh, I think the New York Times, amongst others, endorsed him. And, and so we have a series of, of, of uh, newspaper editorials. And generally speaking, you know, do they matter? Maybe do they influence? In a close election, they certainly matter. You know, when you win by 1,797 votes, they matter. And uh, uh, we also highlighted when when the word change was used in any of them, and, and uh, we would highlight that, and we'd just pull up. The, we did a TV spot an endorsement. Okay, New York Times says this. You know, change would be. You know, Tom Kane is a great candidate. Change Trenton would be welcome. You know, the, uh, the the Woodbridge News Tribune says that. You know, boom, and, and if the word change was in there, that's the only. It, it, it was it was sort of a feeble attempt to find a hook in this election, and it was the only thing we could find. But uh, I suspect that with with the what I call the affability factor, and it was a factor, I believe, put him over the top by the narrowest of margins. Was, was there a TV spot uh, that showcased? The, the affability uh, at a bar in Jersey City. He bellied up to a oh, bar. Yeah, that was in a primary. Uh, that was that, that was the Bayonne beer. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, that was Bo Sullivan. God bless him. Bo Sullivan was you know viewed Tom and tried to portray Tom in the primary as a patrician you know uh, you know sort of silver spoon in the mouth kind of character, and he he Bo could have a beer in Bayonne. You know, only he, Bo, could have a beer in Bayonne because Tom would never have a beer any place. That was that was the gist of that. So that was really uh, that was uh, that was Bo Sullivan saying, "We have uh, a, a, you know bottles of beer around it. It literally have a false label and says Bayonne beer on it. You know, someplace that was uh, coming off of that campaign. But that was uh, no, that was Bo Sullivan's uh, gig." <clears throat> but it, but. Who did? Who bellied up to the bar in the commercial? Well, Bo we, we or took, you well, did? Well, we, well, we after after Bo made it an issue. Now I don't know if he ran a TV spot. I don't recall, but but he certainly made the comment, and it was rather, it was rather widely reported. You know that you know Kane can't have a beer in Bayonne, so we took him to a bar in Bayonne. I think that's where we had all those phony beers made up. You know, with with the Bayonne beer on it, we 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 did a stunt. You know, we had a had a, had a, a media uh, stunt there, and we took Tom into. Uh, that was the only time I guarantee you, the only time a, an ounce of beer went into Tom Kane's mouth was was at that out of that bottle at that bar that year. Were you running against <laughs> Brendan Burns record? Uh, to a degree. To a degree. We were just not against his record so much. I remember we made an issue of the of the of the Brendan Byrne arena. That was a backdrop in one of our spots. Uh, you know, so it was really trying to highlight the word and, and it was more of, of a backdrop of a of a thing talking about, you know, not going at burn per se, I don't believe. Though I'd, I'd have to review those television spots that I mentioned. If I can find them, I'll refresh my memory. But the bottom line was is that uh, it, uh, uh, it was a, uh, uh, we didn't go after his, his, his uh, uh, record per se, but I think, I think the whole concept of it's time for a change was. Was that a tricky line for Tom Kane to walk? walk? Yes. Uh, given that Byrne had put him on the highway authority and that they had a cordial exactly. relationship. That's why I, I think there was, you know, some inference, and I use I, I use the word inference to uh, to or, and we tried to infer the uh, the fact that uh, that that it was time for a change. We had eight years of Democrats. Uh, Byrne was, you know, obviously the incumbent, but there was not direct attacks at Governor Byrne. I don't recall at all. Primarily because Tom Kane wouldn't wouldn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, did Roger Stone stay on with Kane? Did he work oh, yeah. in the yeah, 81? He worked in, he worked in the general election of 81, yeah. And, uh, you know, Play any kind of significant role? Uh, Do any dirty tricks? <laughs> Hopefully not, no. I, I, he, I don't think his role was as significant as it was in a primary, as I mentioned the Jack Kemp situation and others, and, and sort of the formulation of that tax plan. But he was still on, on board, as was Bailey Deardorff. John Deardorff was our media guy. And, uh, did you have contact with John Deardorff? Oh yeah, oh yeah, sure. You know, regularly he was. You know, he, you know, he was. You know, you know how those. Uh, you you try to save every dollar, particularly in the general election, for for your for your television. Now, I don't remember what the limits were. I think it was four or five million dollars. It was in that ballpark. What the cap was, the max that could be spent, maybe even less, in that general election. 
and we tried to save every darn penny that we could, you know, to put on 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 television. You know, one of the interesting dynamics, by the way, of, of was the whole rule, the old, how the election law enforcement commission governed what you could or couldn't do under the public financing scheme. Uh, Ray Bateman, unfortunately, back in 1977 in the general election. Uh, was fined, uh, fine is not the word, but basically docked off of his cap because his Republican Party money was spent that was perceived or at least ruled uh, uh, on by ELEC to be, uh, should have been properly under the, the cap limit. So in other words, the rule, what can, what can the organization do? How, you know, we had, to, uh, we had a whole series of, uh, of rulings that we asked for early on, right after the primary. Okay, what can the party do that's regular party building, you know, register, voter registration, turn out the vote, all this kind of thing, that would, does not count against the cap, because we didn't want to be placed in the circumstance that Ray Bateman was four years prior. Uh,